Shalom, shalom, friends. Thank you so much for being here. Great to see everyone. Thank you for joining. We're excited for this uh, unique learning today from a scholar and a chaver, real deep neshama. And um, Rabbi Daniel Raphael Silverstein is a rabbi, educator, meditation teacher, and MC poet. Um, he lives in Israel with his family where he directs applied Jewish spirituality. I hope everyone will check out this program and sign up for, consider signing up for courses over there with him. I just put the link in the side. Um, he is an accredited teacher of Jewish meditation, excuse me, Jewish mindfulness meditation and regularly teaches classes and retreats. He currently teaches for the conservative yeshiva, conservative yeshiva, Romamu yeshiva and my Jewish learning. After receiving smicha from Yeshiva Tchovavei Torah Rabbinical School, he served as Director of Jewish Life and Learning for Hillel of Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. He was born and raised in London, where he is today or tonight, and he received a BA from the University of Cambridge and an MA from Warwick University. He spent three years in Israel studying in Yeshivot uh, Ein Surim, Svile HaTorah, and Mali Gavoa. Daniels performed and facilitated all over the world as a spoken word artist, MC, and creative educator. And the Jewish Week selected him as one of the 36 under 36 young innovators shaping the Jewish community. Dan is a co-founder of Lines of Faith, a Muslim Jewish hip hop and poetry collective that uses performances and workshops to challenge prejudice and build meaningful bonds between communities. Um, he is a creative person, a person rooted in ethics and in spirituality. Rev. Daniel, it's an honor to have you here with us. Really, thank you so much, Rav Shmuley. Thank you, Rav Shmuley, and also to Eddie for having me. Uh, it's really an honor for me to do something for you, Rav Shmuley. Uh, you know, as as you guys will probably know, having signed up for this program, it's an organization that does so much to bring Tikkun to the world and uh, to create and propagate a Judaism that we can really be proud of in our world. So, really, thank you for having me. I uh, have something to share, source sheet on our subject today, and. I'm going to do that and introduce uh, how it's going to flow to begin with. So I was told 40, 45 minutes of presentation and then 15 minutes for question and answer. So I'm, things may come up that you want to ask about or respond to, but try and just write it down and save it. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have time because um, I planned it accordingly. Uh, the beginning, I'm, I'm going to run through quite a lot of sources fairly quickly to just to give like a little picture, a big picture, a wide picture, uh, but not go super deep of different approaches to the question of Jews and humanity in various sources, trying to be roughly chronological in my approach most of the time. But what I really want to make sure I do is save time to go deep and slow into the important sources towards the end. So uh, that's the plan. And uh, God willing, it will go something like that. So beginning with uh, Genesis chapter one, Bereshit. God creates man in his image, as it says, we're all created in the image of God. Every single person is created in the image of God. That's the starting point of this whole conversation. Of course, what our tradition, what Torah writ large does with that is incredible. You know, the conversation, uh, I, we only have time tonight, today, to bring a tiny fraction of it. But it's just incredible the diversity of it. Just a couple of examples that didn't have time to squeeze onto the sheet. Uh, to mention, you know, uh, the Mishnah in Sanhedrin says that when people are witnesses in a capital case, when somebody's life is on the line in court, then the witnesses are threatened or intimidated or warned. You know, by the way, if you kill someone uh, from, from the Jewish people, uh, or if you save a life from the Jewish people, that's like destroying or creating the whole world. But we have another version of the same text in the Yerushalmi, in the Jerusalem Talmud, which says exactly the same thing, but it doesn't say anything about the Jewish people. It just says, if you kill someone, it's like destroying the world, or if you save someone, it's like saving the whole world. So right from the very beginning, from our earliest texts and our interpretations of, of this of this line here, right at the beginning of the, of the Torah, we see it's possible to take a, what we can call like maybe a Judeo-centric or a more particularistic approach or a much more universalistic approach. We see this over and over again. And the next step I, I want to mention in this conversation 
you know, having <laughs> just very quickly addressed uh, the diversity of approaches to Adam, to humanity as a whole, to Adam, that we all come from, of course, is, of course, there's uh, a step in the story, which is the election of the Jewish people, that we are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. It begins with Abraham, with God choosing Abraham and saying, you, you know, I want you to go to a certain place and fulfill a certain role. So this uh, Midrash has always spoken to me very powerfully about one approach of, of how we could see that. Rabbi Yehuda taught the entire world was standing on one side, Ever, and he was on the other side, Ever. And that is why he says, Abraham is called, is called Avram Ha'ivri, Ivri, the Hebrew, that we are the Hebrews. You know, Rabbi Yehuda is saying one way of understanding this, it's not the only way, but one way of understanding what it means to be a Hebrew is to be on the other side. And this is put into more kind of modern language by uh, Rabbi Judith Rosenberry in her lecture to Leo Beck College here. She says, the role of the Jewish people and Jewish teachings in this world is being the historical deconstructors of oppressive meta-narratives. And if that wasn't clear enough in English, because I have a lot of long words, what does that mean? It means every time there's a paradigm and, th and there's you know, oppression in that paradigm, which of course is almost always the case so far looking back in human history, right? Whenever there's oppression in a paradigm, the Jewish people very often do play the role of challenging that paradigm and helping that paradigm move on. And so we can explain that in many different ways, but that's just the role that we have played in Tachlis like in action one way or the other. And we also see this very importantly, since we're just talking still about foundations, one last foundational piece I want to talk about is Jacob, Yaakov, because we are the children of Israel. Israel is another name for Jacob, the final patriarch. And Jacob is named Israel in this line here in the Torah in Genesis 32. It says, you, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and men and have prevailed. So we we already talked about being called Hebrews, right? And one way we can understand what it means to be a Hebrew and how we can understand being Israel is we struggle with both the infinite, the divine, the transcendent, the mysterious, but also we struggle with what's down here. Like that is part of what it means to be B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, the Jewish people, as we call ourselves after our ancestors. So we can take that in a lot of different directions. You know, of course, we can struggle. Ultimately, that struggle can be one um, of universalism, right? The struggle can be we're like struggling for a world of universal dignity and unity, but that's not uh, me love, as we say in Hebrew, that's not to be taken for granted. Like maybe that's what the struggle is, but that's not how it's always interpreted, as we'll see. So here's a table that shows some non-Jews in the Torah and throughout our tradition who had very, very positive roles. I'm mentioning, just trying to cover ground here with a quick like survey. Melchizedek is called a priest of the Most High God in Genesis. Mamre is a friend of Abraham who is given credit for telling Abraham in the Midrash. It says he's the one who tells Abraham about doing circumcision and how to do it. It's, it's a very interesting Midrash. Ruth the Moabite. Ruth, now the Moabites are not just any non-Jewish people. They're non-Jewish people who were explicitly told in the Torah, we can never have anything to do with them until the 10th generation. They're our enemy. They have many, many bad qualities. But Ruth becomes ancestress to King David and then the Messiah through her righteousness. It's an amazing story. And so, right, of course, that's the story of Ruth Megillat, Ruth, the story of Ruth that we read on Shavuot, very related to the festival coming up soon. Batia, the daughter of Pharaoh, defies her father's decree to save Moses. Another incredible story right there in the Peshat, in the plain meaning, in the words of the Torah itself. The Midrash adds nice things, but you don't even need the Midrash. Uh, Yitro, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Not Jewish, but the Torah is given in the portion named after him. He's called a beloved friend to God, Chovav is one of his names. He tells Moses how to make the Torah into a workable legal system. He gets so much credit. Again, most of that is right there in the Peshat of the Torah itself, in the, in the Torah, and you know the Midrash adds many nice things. A very quick uh, snippet from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. We're going to see a longer piece from him later that's very deep. But here he just points out about Batia, Pharaoh's daughter. He says, instead of Pharaoh's daughter, Read Hitler's daughter or Stalin's daughter. And just think about that. You know, Pharaoh is not just any guy, not just any non-Jewish guy. Pharaoh is the epitome of evil and oppression at that point. 
and he's doing terrible things already. And his daughter is standing up and being an incredibly righteous person, an incredibly brave person. As Rabbi Sachs says, just skipping to the end of his piece here, nothing could signal more powerfully that the Torah is not an ethnocentric text, that we must recognize virtue wherever we find it, even among our enemies. And I want to say, as we say in Hebrew, halavai, like I wish it was so meaning, I, I wish it were the case that that was the only possible read, or that we could always say definitely that there's nothing ethnocentric going on throughout our tradition. But I want to say also, credit where credit is due, um, to Rabbi Sachs, the one of Racha, it's a very valid reading. You know, I think it's a very well-founded, solid reading and a very important piece of the conversation. And one uh, one really nice uh, theme that goes along with that is the theme of a Malek. It's a much bigger conversation than we have time to fully deal with in this session. But a Malek, a Malek as you may know, is this people who attack the children of Israel as soon as they leave Egypt. And Amalek becomes like a code word in our tradition for the epitome of evil. Amalek, Amalek attack us just because, just because they can't bear to see us be on passion, on fire with holiness and being close to God and so on. And Amalek really come, as I say, to be like the most evil thing we can imagine in this world. But there's a twist. In the Talmud, it says here in Sanhedrin, where did the Amalek come from? They come from this story. They say there that Timna sought to convert. And as it says in the verse above, Timna was a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz. So Timna sought to convert. Timna comes to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of our patriarchs, great people. And she says to them, please accept me as a convert. I want to join this amazing project you're doing. You're having this, this whole Jewish people thing going on. I want to be part of it. But they rejected her. We don't know why. They didn't say. So she went and became a concubine of Eliphaz, son of Esau, saying, it is preferable to be a maidservant for this nation rather than a noblewoman for another nation. So that's like she can't join the Jewish people. She's not allowed to. We don't know why. She's rejected by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So she says, this is the closest I can get. I'm going to try my best to attach myself to the closest person I can to the Jewish people. So I'm so desperate to be part of them. And it goes on. Amalek, son of Eliphaz, emerged from her, who afflicted the Jewish people. And Amalek, as I say, is not just not just an oppressor, but the ultimate evil for us throughout our tradition. What is the reason the Talmud asks for this affliction? What, why does Amalek treat us so badly? Why do we have this thorn in our side persecuting us in every generation? The Talmud says explicitly, they should not have rejected her. Rejected her. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's saying very clearly, very plainly, in black and white in the Talmud, were at fault. They did the wrong thing. And this is one of the most amazing things about tradition, not only this piece specifically, but what this is an example of. There is no such thing as a fear of self-criticism or a fear of taboo or a fear of asking the wrong question. In so many of our texts, we see astoundingly radical ideas being, being explored very courageously, including the possibility that we ourselves might be at least partially in some way to blame for the evil and suffering that we ourselves suffer. And, and it's not, it's not, I don't want to go to the extreme of saying like uh, blaming the victim, you know, in the, in the kind of like specific case, God forbid, but writ large as a general principle, it's an incredibly powerful lens to approach the world by. And by the way, we see the same thing again with the destruction of the temples. We see, you know, the rabbis could have just said, yeah, the temples were destroyed because Babylon was a very powerful empire and they had a big army. And then Rome was an even more powerful empire and they had an even bigger army. The rabbis don't say that. They say the temples were destroyed because we were lacking in the following ways. And therefore we have something to grow and learn from that experience. And you know that powered our transformation and our growth. And I would say it powered our survival, that ability to be self-critical and to keep growing and changing as opposed to stagnating. So it, it's, a, it's a tough pill to swallow, but ultimately, I think, a very healthy one. So that's, that's one piece I want to bear in mind as we look at the later texts, the very important idea of self-criticism uh, that's present already in the early tradition. And there's another idea uh, from these verses in Deuteronomy, Devarim, says, uh, when the Most High gave nations their lot, when he separated the sons of man, he set up the boundaries of peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. I'll just read that last bit again. He set up the boundaries of peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. What's going on here? 
There are 17 A Rashi explains. This is the next source. Rashi explains, but I'm going to explain Rashi and say it more plainly. Rashi explains there are 70 primal nations in the world, 70 primal languages uh, that come from uh, the 70 descendants of uh, the sons of Noah after the flood. And that corresponds, Rashi says here, based on the ancient Midrash, that that 70 nations corresponds to the 70 souls of the children of Israel who entered Egypt, who went down to Mitzrayim. So what that means is on some level, the ancient Midrash, which again, Rashi is quoting, is saying that Midrash is saying that we are a microcosm of humanity. And actually, there's a quote. I think I put it here on the sheet. Yeah, there you go. Rabbi Lionel Blue, sometimes attributed also to Mark Twain. Who knows? I, don't, I could not find it in Mark Twain, but maybe he said it. Jews are just like everyone else, only more so. And, you know, there's we can like smile and laugh at that quote and recognize that there's something kind of chauvinistic about it. There's also something true on a historical level because, you know, we were exiled to almost every corner of the world. And therefore, we really did come into conversation with and take on a lot of the characteristics of virtually every nation of the world. And then, of course, now we're in this unbelievable, unprecedented thing where many of us are coming back together. You know, I myself, as Shmuley mentioned, have the privilege of being part of that, of living in Israel with Jews from all over the world, coming all with their own languages and their own neuroses and their own histories and their own foods and their own clothes. It's a mess. But there is something very true and powerful about that observation that we in some way reflect humanity. Of course, was that the, was that true on some metaphysical level even before the exile? I have no idea at all. But that is the claim of the Midrash, that those 70 souls of Israel somehow connect to the 70 nations of the world. So I want, want to bear these ideas in mind as we, uh, you know, for when we look at the later text, the more, the more recent text. A couple more foundational ideas I want to see first, though. One is in this snippet in the Talmud from Shabbat 88b. It says, when the Torah is given in Mount Sinai, Every time God spoke here, I'll quote it, each and every utterance that emerged from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be he, divided into 70 languages. But what does that mean? What it sounds like. God spoke about Sinai in 70 languages simultaneously. I always used to think this was like, uh, for those of you who ever watched Star Trek, you know, they have those like uh, magical simultaneous uh, uh, translating devices, right? So like somehow God is transmitting and as we said before, 70 is not just any number, right? There are 70 primal languages and peoples in the world. In other words, he's talking to everyone, right? He, she, it, the mystery, right? The insof, the infinite one. The Torah is being given simultaneously to everyone. We have other Midrash that talks about how the Torah is given. Uh, every individual receives what they can at their level, according to who they are, and so on. So it's not just like, you know, here's the Torah, exactly what, you know, uh, the only the kind of like fixed written canonized version that we think we know. It's it's much more subjective than that. Every, it's given to everyone. We might also think it's fundamentally primarily a Jewish thing. Also, we see again, when the Jewish people enter the land of Israel, we see that the tradition, the Midrash and the Talmud say that the Torah was inscribed on rocks on the way into the land of Israel in 70 languages which you know there are arguments about like how that was logistically possible or not or maybe it doesn't mean the whole torah because they're like inscribing the whole torah 70 times in 70 languages you need a lot of rocks and it takes like, a long time but like that's the tradition wants to make a point which is the torah is it needs to be read and understood by everyone even though there's so much in the torah about our people and about our special relationship with god and so on it's not only for us it's it's bigger than that now, which brings us to the whole issue of chosenness. As it says here in Exodus 19, God says to us, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my segula, my treasured people, my treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine. and You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. So there's vast literature about um, Segula, chosen people, what does it mean? Do we reject it altogether today or do we find ways to accept it? Rabbi Norman Lamb, beautiful, beautiful article here. He says there are two parts of it. 
with being a Goy Kadosh, a holy nation, being a Mamlechet Kohenim, a kingdom of priests, means the, the first part is we have to focus on ourselves and what he calls our own collective self transcendence, which is a very beautiful way of putting it, our own spirituality, elevating ourselves. And the second part is, he says, being a kingdom of priests. He says, being a priest implies being an educator, being a teacher. And what that means is we have a job to elevate everyone else as well. So there's, as I think there's a very beautiful way of looking at it. Like the chosenness is broken down to these two roles, as it says here in the verse, the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And it means we have to elevate ourselves and also be outward looking and seeking to elevate others. Now, there's, a, there's another fascinating trend for how chosenness is approached in our tradition. It says here in the Talmud in Beza, why was the Torah given to the Jewish people? Rabbi Meir says, because they are, and you can translate this word as stubborn or impudent, as in, as like the goat, stubborn or impudent. And then it goes on to say, uh, this is just amazing, the ways of these people are like fire. It says the Torah is a fiery law. Uh, I've skipped down a bit. The ways of these people are like, Torah, are like fire. As were it not for the fact that the Torah was given to the Jewish people, no nation or tongue could withstand them. I'll just read that again. It's just amazing. The ways of these people are like fire. As were it not for the fact that the Torah was given to the Jewish people, no nation or tongue could withstand them. What's it saying? It's saying, first of all, the Torah was only given to us because we are impudent or stubborn, right? Stiff-necked people, as we say, right? The Torah says. And second of all, we might think uh, chosenness implies and being given the Torah implies, oh, we're so great. God gave us the Torah because we're way better than everyone else. And, you know, maybe you grew up. I certainly have heard there are teachings in our tradition along those lines. There certainly is material like that. But this, again, this is from the Talmud, canonized rabbinic material, is actually taking a very different approach, saying, it says, we are so fiery that we had to be given the Torah in order to make us safe for others. That if we weren't given the Torah, we will be a danger to the world. So it's a very different approach. It actually reminds me of how um, Reb Zalman Shachta Shlomi uh, teaches about the Brit, the covenant given to Pinchas. He says, you know, Pinchas is given a Brit of Shalom, a Brit Shalom, a covenant of peace. But And Reb Zalman explains it's because he needs it. Like <laughs> the way Pinchas acts is so zealous and not shalom dick, not, not a peaceful, so that um, he needs to be contained. And this is really what the Talmud is saying about the Jewish people. So we might, again, you might take getting the Torah and being a amsegula, a chosen people in the direction of kind of uh, pride, haughtiness, arrogance, chauvinism. Actually, the Talmud is suggesting there's an alternative to really, really a, a humility. And also, I, I love the self-awareness and the lack of fear of self-criticism here in saying, you know, we are stubborn and impudent, as the Torah itself says, we're stiff-necked, and we need to, to be reined in by the Torah, as it were. So it's, it's a different approach. So there's, uh, this is uh, the last of our, our approaches from the classical rabbinic text, this Midrash from Vayikra Rabba, Leviticus Rabba. It says, God desires the pursued. Rav Huna said in the name of Rav Yosef, God always desires the pursued. And then it gives lots of examples, righteous person, wicked person, in every possible case, it says, skipping down a few lines, in every possible case, just highlight this, God desires the pursued. And then it's an amazing midrash. It goes on to give unbelievable list of examples for how God always desires the pursued as opposed to the, we could say the oppressed, as opposed to the oppressor. Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, every single one of these people, it says who they're being chased or oppressed by. And we are always the descendants of the ones who are being oppressed and chased. And God is always on the side of those who are the ones running away, the oppressed or the pursued. Joseph, Moses, David, Saul. As it says, finally, Israel are pursued by the nations and the blessed Holy, Holy One chose Israel. As it says, Hashem, your God chose you from among all other peoples on earth to be his treasured people. Uh, again, I'm Sugula. So this is just a fascinating read of what it means to be a treasured people. And I think particularly interesting in, in our world today, in the context of, of uh, like the political discussion going on in America and in other places, that it's actually because we were oppressed, 
that we were chosen. And Rabbi Sachs, and this is where I want to slow down a little bit and do a, a deeper read, a slower read here, because Rabbi Sachs offers an incredible reading of this, which really just blew my mind. So I'm going to read most of this, and then we're going to jump to the, uh, the mystical text. So Rabbi Sachs says, do you not think that God choosing one people means he rejects every other people? Absolutely not. That was never our way. And that why, again and again, again and again and again, God, the prophets say, is not our God only. There are other people who worship God. And finally, my final question, why on earth did he choose us? I'll tell you, God chooses, chooses those whom the world rejects. That is why he chose us. In the ancient world, power and position went to the firstborn. That is why God always chooses the younger rather than the elder. Abel instead of Cain, Isaac instead of Ishmael, Jacob instead of Esau, Moses instead of Aaron, David instead of all his brothers. In the ancient world, power went to the strong and the many. The Jewish people was always a tiny people. Ki atem hama'at mekol ha'amena. You were the smallest of all peoples, pasuk in Deuteronomy and Devarim. God chooses whom the world rejects. He chooses the marginal, the nomads, the few, the young. People who, whether in their own land from then to today, to live in Israel is to live in a tiny country surrounded by big empires at the juncture of three continents. Israel are always, always was a tiny people surrounded by big neighbors. Secondly, in the dispersion, we were a minority, disempowered and scattered throughout the world. It is the people who are vulnerable, who are exposed, who are at risk. On them, God shows his special love. That is why the treatment of Jews in history has always been a litmus test of the humanity of any age. It is why the Jewish story has always been a great narrative of hope, because it is the story. And that is why it spoke to the founding fathers of America, who were trying to set up something against the British. Why it spoke to black civil rights activists who were trying to create a space for themselves in America, because the Jewish story was always of a people who were vulnerable, small, weak, exposed, afraid, and yet who never lost hope. And as a result, never ceased to be. That is why the Jewish story in its unique particularity is the human story in its universality. If we would have been everyone in general, we would never have been somebody in particular. And this now he gives it a twist, which I think is very powerful. So hold on. He says, and if we hadn't been somebody in particular, we never would have a message for humanity in general. It is in our particularity that we discover our universality. And with this, I come to the crux. I said that the confrontation in the ancient world was between ancient Greece and ancient Israel. And that is fundamentally, at, well, and that is what is fundamentally at stake in our human situation. Do we go with civilization, with ancient Greece, with the enlightenment that values universality, or do we go with the Jewish vision that focus on, focuses on particularity, on what makes us different from one another? And that is a question. Imperialism is the attempt to impose my truth, my culture, my way of doing things on you. And that is what Judaism came into the world to protest against. Judaism is God's protest against empires. I love that line. Judaism is God's protest against empires. God says it is not so. No people is entitled to force its beliefs on any other people. Down here in the world that I made, God says there are many cultures, many faiths, many civilizations, each of which was made by me, each of which therefore has its own integrity, its own gifts to humanity, its own contribution to make in its own voice, its own language, its own character. I want, says God, to communicate that truth to the world. Therefore, I will choose one people, a small, vulnerable people, not particularly righteous. In fact, very often, very bullshit, as the Talmud says, right? We're stubborn and arrogant and uh, insolent. And I will command that people to be different, to show the world the dignity of difference, the reality of difference. Judaism is a truth of the unity of God, but the diversity of mankind. We, be, we do not believe that e pluribus unum, out of the many come one. We believe that out of the one come many. So there's so much here, but I really want to just focus on it, is his claim that the fact that we are chosen 
uh, in our smallness, in our vulnerability, is a message to all of humanity that difference is part of God's plan. That we teach the world that lesson. And indeed, looking back at Jewish history, it's a pretty solid read of history, even if we look from a completely secular historical lens, that we have played that role in a lot of times and places. Um, let's move now to the mystical uh, milieu. I'm going to skip a little bit of material on the sheet. You can look at it yourselves. It just shows different times and places and different attitudes towards Jews and non-Jews, uh, depending on the relationship between them. Let's skip to Rabbi Arthur Green here introducing a Hasidic text and talking about the Kabbalah and the Zohar and, and uh, which uh, led to Hasidism and how much of Jewish mysticism does not seem to take a very favorable view of non-Jews. And this is what Rabbi Arthur Green has to say about that. He says, written in 13th century Christian Spain, it is no apology for the Zohar to say that its worldview simply mirrored back the worldview of the larger society. If the Jew was demon and sorcerer to the mind of medieval Christendom, the Christian or the Gentile per se, no distinction between Christians and others is made in this literature, was the embodiment of evil and violence in the eyes of the Jew. The socio-historical situation of the Jew in Eastern Europe gave free reign to such a fantasy portrait of the world around him. The horrendous atrocities of the Kelmanitsky massacres were well remembered in Hasidic times, as were the more recent and equally bitter memories of the renewed Ukrainian pogroms of 1768. What little contact Jews had with churchmen was at best hostile and disputatious, and more than a few clergy were seen by Jews as among the most active agitators to pogroms. So he's, uh, he's, you know, he says it's no apology to say that, but we might call it apologetics in some way. He's saying that, you know, the context of, of the Zohar, first of all, and then of the later Hasidic teachings does go a long way to explain it. But let's see some of the material inside. And uh, we'll see some exceptions too, some very surprising exceptions. The first of all, the Zohar takes this line from the Talmud, you are human, you speaking to the Jewish people, the other nations are not. The Talmud says this too, the Talmud doesn't say in a context where it's clear it's making a theological statement. Uh, it's it's really talking about something very technical and legalistic, and, and it's, re it's really not clear to me what what it's trying to say in terms of theology or if it's transcending at all. But the Zohar is making a theological statement here about Jews and non-Jews. And uh, it's, you know, this is the strain of the conversation that we have to contend with and be aware with that, that this is part of the Jewish chauvinism that Art Green was addressing there in that piece, that we we looked at ourselves, we looked at the people outside of ourselves who were acting, we might say, inhumanly. And we looked at ourselves who seemed to be acting more humanly. And we said, well, I guess we're more human than they are. I guess, I guess if they're acting demonically, that's because they are possessed by demons. As the Zoh but the Zohar doesn't only say that. It's really important to say, even the Zohar has many passages in it which talk about universal redemption, universal consciousness, drawing on the, the prophecies of Isaiah and other prophets which talk about the messianic redemption in universal terms and says here come and see the valley of vision is Shekhinah who resided in the temple and from whom all the inhabitants of the world suck the milk of prophecy it's just one example where we're talking about all the inhabitants of the world in terms of the evolution of consciousness and everyone being part of that vision so even in the Zohar which certainly does portray Jews and non-Jews as being very different, even essentially or metaphysically different sometimes, there is still that universalistic vision for redemption too. So skipping forward from uh, Kabbalah in uh, you know, the 13th century to the late 18th century to Hasidut, the beginning, quite near the beginning of Hasidut, the beginning of Chabad Lubavitch Hasidut, uh, the Uta Rebbe, Rav Shnei Zaman of Liadi, wrote the Tanya, uh, really the first attempt in Hasidut to create a systematic uh, theology, which is, uh, it's very un-Hasidic uh, to do that. Many people, many people love it and regard it as very authentic Hasidut, and many people think it's uh, a very strange aberration within Hasidut. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a subject different people to feel differently about. But the theology is, he says here, the lower or animal souls of Jews emanate from a mixture of good and bad, from Klipat Noga, as it's called in Hebrew, whereas the souls of the nations of the world emanate from those unclean Klipot, the spiritual husks, which contain no good 
whatsoever, as it's written in the Eitz Chaim, that's uh, from Rabbi Isaac Lura and his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, that all the good that the nations do is done from selfish motives. So he's making a very clear distinction between Jews and non-Jews, that we, 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 everyone has an animal soul, a lower soul, according to the, this theology, and that ours comes from a place that mixed good and bad, and therefore it can be drawn to good, but those of non-Jews is not so. It's only, it's drawn from a place that is only bad. Now, this, this piece of Tanya is very controversial and has led to a huge amount of literature and debate. Um, if you look on the Chabad.org website, where it's elucidated, uh, Rabbi Yosef Weinberg, uh, points out, he says it should be noted that among the nations of the world, there are also to be found those whose souls are derived from Klipat Noga, and they're called the pious ones of the nations of the world, the Hasidei Umot Olam. And uh, so he, he's pointing out that the theology we just saw of that difference between Jews and non-Jews is not 100%, not all the time. And that's, and that's true. But still, uh, as a qu quote here, uh, from uh, Dan Rickman on this online debate. The question is, is our racism better than ra their racism? And I think it's a, it's a fair, fairly strong, I think a fairly fair question for us to, to wrestle with, you know, that how this uh, how this applies. We're going to skip what Baruch Katt says. You can look at it later if you're interested in this question. And there's a link there to, to much more material too. Because I want to show a different approach in Hasidut. This is the approach of the Mo'oinayim, the Chernobyl Rebbe, who was a very close friend and student of the Baal Shem Tov himself, the founder of Hasidism. And I'm going to read this teaching because uh, it's, it have to speak to itself for itself because of the time. So he says, now the whole entire earth was of one language. Our sages in uh, Jerusalem Talmud explained that they spoke in the holy tongue. The point is that the blessed holy one created the world through Torah and guides the world through Torah. And just as there is no place vacant from him, for their life force and divinity are everywhere, and the Torah and the Holy One are one, so all the worlds and all the peoples receive their vitality from the Torah. So God is in everything. The Torah is in everything. Everything could only exist in this theology because God and the Torah are part of it. Nothing could exist without that. And therefore, Israel were exiled among the nations so that they would clarify those holy letters of the Torah that are mixed among them by their dealings and conversations with them. And Israel thereby raised these words up to their root to Torah. Now, this is a really radical theology of why we're in exile. Why are we in exile, according to this, is to raise up the holy sparks of the, or as he says, the holy letters of Torah. It's uh, interchangeable in his teachings. The, the holy letters of Torah, which contain divinity, which are spread out, scattered in the whole world, which every single thing in the whole world contains, including the nations around us and everything that they have. And how do we do it? Through our everyday business dealings and speech with these people. Now, you might think, you know, people, if I'm, if I'm a Jew living in a ghetto, I should like keep myself to myself, only deal with other Jews and so on. But he's saying, no, we have to deal with raising up the sparks, with raising up the holy letters from everything around us. That's our job. That's why we're here. And he says, if Israel served the eternal with a wholesome consciousness, we would quickly complete the Torah and clarify everything that fell among the nations. But, he says, because of our small-mindedness, we need to endure this lengthy exile until the Messiah comes. May it be speedily in our days, and then the verse will be fulfilled, for then I will convert the peoples to a pure language that all of them call in the name of the eternal to worship him, of one accord so he actually he doesn't um just he doesn't not only not only does he say we need to raise up the holiness in everything around us through our dealings with the non-jews that we are surrounded by but he who remember as most of, who most of the time are often often as art green says are violently oppressing the jews right so it's a very bold claim to for him to say this to say you know, you know those people who are like we're so scared of and who violently oppress us we have a duty to engage with them to raise up the holiness in through those relationships and not only that but he says it's the reason we haven't brought the messiah the redemption yet to our world is because of our cut -nut, our small mindedness that we haven't that we have been too insular that we have not realized god put us here in Ukraine, wherever we are in the world, to raise up the holiness here through our relationships with the people around us. It's incredibly radical theology of dispersion, of exile, and of interrelation 
with Jews and non-Jews. And I'm not, I would, I'm not even saying that he disagrees with Netanyahu, although they did have disagreements, but it's more that it's a question of emphasis. He might agree technically with some of the things that Tanya said, but how he sees our role in the world and our work on the world seems to me to be very different. And this is another teaching here from him. I'm glad we have time for this and we'll see what else we have time for after. He says, it is known that every human who truly serves the blessed creator needs to bring forth their own portion of the Messiah. It's a very powerful teaching about what does the Messiah mean? We all have a piece of the Mashiach, the Messiah inside us. And our job is to each find our own little piece, raise it up, and then that's our contribution to the redemption. It's not something from outside of us. It's something from within us. And we each have to play our own little part. And just skipping a little bit, he says, uh, skipping to the third paragraph, and the idea of Messiah is that Israel will store every aspect of that stature of primal Adam as the, the original first draft of the universe, as it were, for the Kabbalists, before he was diminished. And everyone who serves the blessed God needs to raise up their portion to prepare their portion of this stature. And what's fascinating about this teaching is he starts off saying, he, st he starts off talking about kol adam ha'oved, every human who truly serves the blessed creator. And then he says something about Israel and our special role in that. And then again at the end, he says, about this is about this is about the whole of ed, everyone who serves where and it's, it's just a very very powerful illustration of how i think he himself is grappling with the fact that the history and the tradition of these ideas he's bringing is steeped in a lot of particularism but he i mean he to me is very clear he's trying to push in a more universalistic direction it's like a sandwich of like universal Particular is universal. It's like the way he presents that everyone in the world has a piece of the Messiah that we're all bringing the redemption through working together, essentially. But in the middle there, he acknowledges that, of course, he's drawing on these ideas that say that Israel, that the Jewish people have a special role in that process. See, so we just have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to just give a very, very quick summary of some of what's left on the sheet. See, I might ask for mercy and say, take a couple of extra minutes. Uh, Rav Shmili, I can see your face on my screen. Is that okay? Is that, is that cool? Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is really important for, for, you know, for what I promised I'd try and share. Hillel Zeitlin, early 20th century. He's born into a firm family. Then he embraces the Enlightenment and becomes, it seems, quite secular. And then he re-embraces Judaism as a chassid. And he, he's murdered in uh, the Warsaw Ghetto by the Nazis eventually, but not before he has made an incredible contribution, which lays the foundation for a whole new understanding of Hasidism, of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism. He really lays a foundation for what's sometimes called neo-Hasidism. So let's skip to the, uh, the most essential bit because of the time. He says here, in the Hasidism of the future, the love of God will shine forth and burn even more brightly than it did in the days of the Besh, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, the love of Israel will be transformed into a great worldwide love of humanity. Nevertheless, Israel will always be recognized as the firstborn child of God, the one who has born and continues to bear and will continue to bear the godly light. And he talks, here's a very beautiful passage about how Torah will bring justice to the entire world, how it will merge, with the positive qualities of socialism. It's really beautiful. Um, so I want to point out, you know, his universalism still sees there being difference, as Rabbi Sachs would say, the dignity of difference. It's not that we're, we're aiming for a universalism where everyone is literally exactly the same, right? It's the universalism of diversity. And finally, a very, very quick tour. We won't have time to read it. I want to tell you what Rav Cook says. Rav Cook, again, early 20th century, tremendous Kabbalist and mystic and poet and leader, as well as a halachic, a legal thinker and leader. Um, half, he was half on one side from a Hasidic background and half from uh, a Litvish, Litvak background. So he really kind of embraced and brought together a lot of opposites and reconciled a lot of opposites. And he says here very clearly, as he says in number two, the love of all beings precedes everything else. Afterwards comes the love of all humanity, after that comes the love of the people of Israel, which includes everything. Da, 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 da. So for him, it's very, very clear that universal love, love of everything, of all life, has to be the foundation for everything. And that is not what we find in many other texts 
that talk about love and which talk about our priorities. So he, he, this is an astounding and radical text. And I just want to mention one bit about it, especially if you're going to look at it in your own time. He says at the top of the next page, and even Amalek, we well said before, Amalek is the epitome of, epitome of evil in our tradition. Even Amalek is only to be erased, as the Torah says in Exodus, from under the heavens. The Torah says, wipe out Amalek from under the heavens. And Rav Cook is saying, oh, only from under the heavens, you see? And he says, but through purification, he, Amalek, is elevated to the root of goodness, which is above the heavens. So this is the incredible optimism, in, not in a naive way, but in a fundamentally strong and positive and consistent way of Kabbalah when applied in this way, that everything is infused with divine love, even in Malek. And therefore, of course, it is possible for us to perform some positive tikkun, some positive act of repair with the Malek. And we won't have time to read it now. I just want to encourage you to read in your own time if you're not already familiar with the next piece of Rav Cook. It's called A Fourfold Song. And I'm willing to give you a money back guarantee that if you haven't read it before, if you read it, it will change your life. Because it's the presentation of these questions of particularism and universalism in a very, very creative and beautiful and poetic way, also a very deep way. Essentially saying there isn't a conflict between people's identities, but that our aim should be to have concentric circles, starting with ourselves, and then our people, and then humanity, and then our life, that complement each other, and he compares it to harmony in music, that we ultimately we want uh, this to be a song with all these different elements drawing together. And I think the very, very final thing I want to end with uh, in this very quick summary of these later sources, and then, then we'll have a question and answer and conversation, is um, this quote from Daniel Matt, who uh, recently translated into Zohar, amazing scholar and teacher. I know he's, uh, he's taught here uh, with Rav Shmueli before. He says, um, a covenant for today should be based on oneness, not on cutting or division. This covenant cannot be imposed from above, but will emerge and evolve as we discover our, our interconnection with all of life, since each of us is a unique part of the whole. I'll, uh, I'll rest there, and then I'd love to hear what folks have to ask or say or share about any of this. Feel free to refer back to stuff I said a while ago. Awesome, Rob Daniel. Thank you so much. Okay, we'd love to hear from the Hever here. First of all, just thanks. Uh, I'm trying to be in two worlds at once here in, at my work, but I really couldn't miss this class. Um, but uh, Daniel, just uh, curious in your uh, work in Eretz Israel, um, what do you I, what do you see as uh, Actually, before I'm asking the question, it occurs to me it's not really a fair question. I think it's it's a, sort of a, a, a daily a daily thing. But are, for just for you in your own personal avoda, where where do you feel like uh, the your focus is these days um, in uh, in what you're doing in Eretz Israel? Unmute, unmute. Thanks. Sorry, I thought I muted myself. Um, the truth is, I feel, thanks for the question, Ravi, so great to see you and be with you. Um, the truth is, I feel like I live a kind of double life where I'm, on the one hand, like my daily life, you know, among the the people who, who I live amongst, it, you know, mostly Israelis. Um, and then most of my professional life, I'm actually uh, speaking English to Americans and Europeans. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm uh, facing between those worlds. And, you know, in terms of these questions, um, you know, the, in terms of like Jews and humanity, um, it, it comes up for me in the Israeli political conversation. Uh, it comes up, comes up for me, um, you know, when we're thinking about uh, who we're voting for and why we're voting for them and, you know, and how we think Israel has to address its own minorities you know, and um, its neighbors, you know, and um, it, 
is uh i think it's pretty challenging you know being being unreligious and i'm often mixing with religious folks um it's for me it's pretty challenging to see the national religious camp in israel the dati lumi camp uh is often uh pretty quick to simplify issues and pretty quick to draw upon uh i want to say uh very very heavily simplified and sometimes chauvinistic ideas about about people who are not jewish and uh it, that's something that i find very challenging and actually it, it it impacts my ability to really feel at home in in that community which otherwise would you know in a lot of ways my practice and my theology and everything you know would fit in with that community in some ways but um it's uh it's a challenge yeah it's really a challenge and then uh when i when i come to england you know i, I just landed here a week ago family reasons I, I'm kind of challenged in a different direction by being in a place where as a Jew I experienced a lot of anti-semitism here of different kinds and I don't feel um I don't feel especially safe like as a Jew like walking around being like overtly Jewish not not like in the acute sense that I think I'm like imminently under threat but it's just like a general sense of like I don't want to like fly the flag too high and like I don't I don't want to like go to certain places at certain times on my own and so on um and, ju and just like you know a um a kind of unpleasant aftertaste that comes with that so um yeah those are some of the ways this stuff comes coming up in my own life at the moment thank you so much Rev. Daniel um go ahead uh Avi if you want to respond real quick uh, I think yeah Sorry, are you still making music um, with uh, your Muslim friend? So un unfortunately right now we're not, but it's uh, it's more like a logistical thing. So you know, I hope at some point, please God, Muhammad and I will be, uh, be active together again. Yeah, please God. I love that. Rev Daniel, and there was a point where you talked about how um, there was a clear job not to make everybody be on one religion. Um, how does that conversation come up with uh, Israel right now, where a lot of folks are thinking that concept that Israel needs to be Jewish and Israel needs to be a Jewish state? Because um, that clearly is counter to the narrative that we've seen in clear text here. Yeah, thanks for the question, Eddie. Um, so that theology you're talking about of saying, you know, Judaism is clearly, you know, has a vision for a world um, where, which is diverse theologically. I, I think uh, a lot of people in Israel feel that's okay for the world, but not okay for our country. They're like, you know, that's fine. like, there's a lot of countries out there, let them be diverse, but like, we want our country to be just for us, which, you know, is very, I, you know, I, I really see it in psychological terms, it's a very understandable reaction to the trauma of many, many centuries of persecution. I, you know, that's something I totally get and respect and we even share in that experience myself. Um, but I think they are missing something, which is like, what an amazing opportunity we have by having sovereignty to actually like work out who we are in relationship to the other. You know, isn't that part of what it means to kind of mature to this next level of history? And I'm not saying it's easy, you know, especially given all the historical circumstances that play in the region and all the trauma and baggage that everyone is carrying on every side in every family. But, you know, that it seems to me is just the reality. You know, one of my teachers, I um, just want to make sure I'm quoting the right person here. I believe it's uh, Rob Herzl Hefter who talks about this, who says, you know, like, if we, if we think that the, say, for example, the Palestinian people are just to be like ignored or dismissed or just like we're going to close our eyes and pretend they're going to disappear, then really it actually means we don't have like faith in God because like God put them there. Like we, God, if God brought us back to the land, then God also put them where they are, you know? And so somehow we're being asked to wrestle with that. However, however we do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we have actually, since we are streaming on Facebook, we have a question from uh, somebody on Facebook. Uh, how can we bring this uh, spirituality into our activism? Mm. One, one thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, what I, what I try to present is, uh, you know, that our tradition has so many different voices in it. It's such a rich conversation about this issue. And one thing that comes to mind is, to have compassion 
for whatever we or others are holding in the conversation because there's validity to every position based on everybody's own experience and so we might disagree with people and we might wish that they were in a different place but you know to really honor the fact that you know people do not hold their opinions by accident uh, and to, re to really uh, you know have compassion there and then the second thing is to have our own vision of what we are aiming for and you know what I've tried to present is this idea of uh, you know this this redemptive world that's based on a redemption and a unity of diversity, with a, a unity that really allows for, you know, as Rabbi Sachs says, the dignity of difference. And, you know, I think that is a gift that we can offer the world. I think that is something we can, as Rabbi Sachs tried to do, and, you know, is still, still doing in, in his way, you know, uh, through his teachings and his students, that we can be messengers and agents for saying, it's okay um, to be different, and, it, and difference doesn't have to mean conflict. And the difference can actually be a strength and we are a commodity that's something that can help us to be to repair ourselves and repair the world thank you friends feel free to unmute yourself and ask more questions or type in the chat Um, Rev. Daniel, just circling back to the issue of essentialism, um, how do you think about human essence? You know, on the one hand, we have the existentialists who think um, existence precedes essence. You know, we create ourselves rather than return to ourselves. On the other hand, we have a notion that all people are equal, um, and then we separately have a notion of of um of of various levels of soul within us that differentiate us and so i'm, I'm curious how you think as someone engaged in kabbalah but also as someone who's interested in equality thinking about human essence hmm. i guess uh i focus mostly on the stuff that everybody has in common which is, you know, which is both in my own spiritual practice and, and in what I teach. It's a lot about the body and our emotions, which, you know, in my experience is something that we all share. And, you know, and even, even many Kabbalists, thinking right now of the Piers Etzer Rebbe, the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Eish Kodesh, uh, you know, a relatively recent Kabbalist and very insightful teacher of psychology. You know, he teaches so much about what to do with our soul on the level of emotions, uh, what we call the nefesh. You know, he's actually he doesn't write very often about like the higher levels of soul because partly because we might not encounter them so often. Like most of the time in our day-to-day -day lives, we, we're, uh, we're down here, you know, <laughs> with, with the blood and the emotions and the, the nefesh. So also in my own practice, like that's kind of like where I'm sensitive and where I kind of feel like I tap into like what's going on inside me. And also, as, as I say, when I teach, I find like, you know, that's where I try and meet people where they are. So the, the other stuff I kind of put in the category, I guess, of uh, speculation, you know, like who knows, like maybe, you know, maybe there's something to it, but like, I can't tell you that, right? I, you know, with any certainty and that's okay. You know, I make use of, of what we can rely on and what's, what our own experience validates and uh, all the rest of it, you know, I have great respect and affection for, uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of in the realm of mystery. Yashikoach, amazing to learn with you. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you will check out appliedjewishspirituality.org to continue to learn with Rev. Daniel. And um, tomorrow we're going to learn with Rabbi Jason Weiner um, at, um, at 4 o'clock Eastern time on halachic issues and other Torah re related to living kidney donation, living organ donation. He is a relevant speaker on this, not only because he is a donor, but also because he is an expert in Jewish medical ethics. So we hope you'll consider joining us for that. Rav Daniel, thank you so much. Have a great night in London. Everyone else, wherever you are in the world, wishing you many blessings as well. Thank you.